We, as believers, we have authority through the name of Jesus. See, His name is above every name. His name is above poverty. His name is above defeat. His name is above fear. His name is above addiction. His name is above sickness. When His name is spoken, demons tremble. The storms are calmed by the mention of His name. The dead are raised by the mention of His name. Sick are healed, blind eyes open, lame are walked, food multiplied, all by the mention of the name of Jesus. Let me ask you a question. I need you to be honest, you're in church. How many of you today, you like, really like to sing? I'm not saying you're good at it, you just like to sing. You just, you just enjoy it, right, right, right. Now, okay, to step further, how many of you like to sing when you're alone in your car and you're driving? For real, for real, like me too. Like, I am an amazing singer in the car by myself. Like, y'all just haven't heard it yet. But when I'm by myself and I sing, did anybody hear you sing louder than the radio? Like, you can turn it up, like, like you are, have you done that? Like, right, yeah, like, where I don't even know where the song's at. I'm singing so loud and I'm sure it's really terrible, but like, I'm in it. Like, sometimes I'm in it like, yeah, like, I'm, like, I'm, like, I'm pumped up. But then there's other times where I'm like, this is my jam. And there's other times where I'm about to cry. I'm like, oh, this song just rips me apart. You know what I'm saying? Has anybody been there before? Now, have you ever done that, any one of those different situations, and you're in your car, and you're doing it, and you're singing, and you're pumped up, or you're really sad, and you're crying, like, oh, this is getting me. And you look over. And you're like, oh, that wasn't me. I wasn't doing anything. I was stretching. I was, there was something in my eye. There was, you know, you, you get embarrassed. Anybody ever done that before? You get embarrassed, right? Right? You know what that's called? Fear of man. Fear of man. Because you're worried about what their opinion is above God's opinion of you. You stop praising, you'll stop worshiping, because you're afraid of what man might say. I'll give you a definition. Fear of man is a dangerous fear of other people's disapproval. Very dangerous fear. It is often unrecognized, oftentimes goes undiagnosed. It robs us of love, <laughs> but sometimes it's robed as if it is love but it's covered in conceit. Some people just love to look like they're loving. But see, this fear of man, it pretends to be love, it blinds us to love, and then it ends up even blinding us to love itself, who is our God. In our teens, it's called peer pressure. Adults, it's called people-pleasing. In the Bible, it's called fear of man. Have you ever struggled with peer pressure? Have you ever struggled with being accepted? Have you ever struggled with being disapproved by other people? Are you overcommitted in your life today? Do you always say yes to certain people because you really want them to like you? Is self-esteem a critical concern of yours? Is embarrassment and shyness a problem that you have? Do you second-guess your decisions based on what people think because you're trying to serve two gods? Do other people make you angry or depressed because you're concerned about their approval of you? They just might be the center of your life. Do you avoid people? Do you avoid conflict? If you say yes to any of those things, that's called a fear of man. Why do we fear people? Why do we fear man? Why do we want people to, to like us so much? Why do we become people pleasers? I'll give you four quick reasons. Number one, people seem closer than God. Right? They seem because they're right there in front of me. I can see them. Right? And I cannot see the invisible God. So sometimes just because they, they seem closer to God, I want to please them instead of God. Right? Number two, rewards for fearing a man or person, they seem immediate. Sometimes I'll forget that God wants to reward me and guide me right now in my life today, but man, if I could just make, if they'll just like me, I'll get a, I'll, they'll, they'll, they'll give me a thumbs up. If they'll just like me right now, I'll get a heart. If they'll just like me right now, I'll get a reward right now in this very moment. The third thing is people can hurt us. It's another reason why. They actually can. And you've all been there. You, you have had people who, even people that you love and love you, hurt you. And so you want to please them. 
Number four, we, we don't think God really cares what we do. We don't, that's not true, but we think, we don't think God really cares what we do. So we'll call ourselves a Christian, but we're a functional atheist. That's what it looks like. Because I'm more pleased, I am more concerned about pleasing people than I am about pleasing God. Now let me give you a little asterisk here. As Christians, we should want to please the people that we actually love and people that love us, like your family, your spouse, your kids, your boss, your friends, right? You should actually want to please them and that you want them to be happy. You want to be a source of joy for them and they are going to be a source of joy for you and that there is accountability in that, which is awesome. That's a great thing. But the problem is this. The problem is when pleasing others is bigger than pleasing God. Let me ask you this question. Who is on the throne over your life? Every single one of you have a throne over your life that you allow someone to sit in that throne. Who is sitting on the throne of your life? If it's anybody but Jesus, it's called the fear of man. Proverbs 29, 25, I'm going to say it again. The fear of man brings a what? A snare. A snare. What's a snare? It's a trap. A snare is a trap. So when you fear other people and you're more concerned about what they think about you and if they approve you or disapprove you or whatever that is, you are stepping into a trap that is disguised and it is harmful. The question is this, why is the fear of man a trap? Why does Proverbs 29 verse 25 say this? Why is the fear of man bringing a trap to our lives? I'll give you four things. Number one, it blinds us to God's purpose for our lives. The fear of man will blind you to what God is really calling you to do with your life. Why? Because, see, you can't focus on what God wants you to do and what others want you to do at the same time. You can't, right? You can't serve two gods. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 4. Our purpose is to please God, not people. He alone examines the motives of our hearts. You can't hide that. Listen, what's our purpose? Your purpose, my purpose as followers of Jesus, is to please God, not people. Amen. And see, what happens is if you start staring at other people, the temptation you're going to have is just to start to focus on them, and then you start to compare yourself with them. And God has never called you to compare yourself with other people. Why do they have this? Why, do they, why don't I have this? And, and then you, you, you start to walk yourself down a path of envy and jealousy, and you'll completely miss what God has for your life. Another way that it's a trap is it keeps us from growing in our faith. A fear of man will keep you from growing in your faith. See, when, when people are bigger than God in our lives, you're allowing them to have influence over your life. When people are bigger than God in your life, you're allowing them to have authority over you and your life and your future, by the way. Let me tell you this, you're only going to grow in the direction and the capacity of the one that you fear. Yep. There's some of you here today, you are very limited on your growth because of the people you surround yourself with and because you are bowing down to their authority and their influence in your life. You're bowing down to the wrong crowd. Exodus chapter 23, verse 2. You must not follow the crowd in doing wrong. The word is very clear. You are not to follow those who are not following the Lord. Let me make it very clear to you today. You're either growing spiritually or you're shrinking spiritually. There is no (laughs) in-between. So what we need is we need God to be bigger than their expectations. We need God to be bigger than their disappointments about me. I need God to be bigger in my life than some anger that they might have towards me. And if God isn't bigger than their opinions, then he's not big enough to fear. He has to be bigger. The third way the fear of man can be a snare, it causes hypocrisy in our lives. Hypocrisy. What's hypocrisy? It's acting. It's acting. Let me tell you something. For little kids, acting's cute, right? We're going to see it here in about a week, and they dress up and all that, whatever. That's cute. That's cute, right? It's not cute on adults. In fact, if you're walking in hypocrisy or if you've ever been there, you know you're going to connect exactly what I'm saying. It's exhausting. 
It's exhausting to try to act like somebody that you're not. <laughs> and what happens is when you're acting like somebody you're not, you're going to get tired trying to keep up with the duplicity, right? And what happens because of your, your exhaustion, you'll compromise your beliefs, which will lead you to sin. And now that you're, you start walking in sin because of your exhaustion, of your hypocrisy, you're actually going to hide things from the people around you who could actually help you. So fear of man actually produces sin. Luke chapter 16, verse 15, a verse says this. Then he said to them, Jesus speaking, you like to appear righteous in public, but God knows your hearts. You like to appear a certain way. You'd like to act a certain way. And this is why some people who call themselves Christians, they will say things PC only. Let me define it to you. There are some people who call themselves Christians who are hypocrites, who will not stand on the word of God and will only say things when it comes to God, if they're questioned, they'll only say things that are politically correct to save their face, right? <laughs> to please other people and not to please God. I've said it before. I'll say it again. If you're doing things that please other people, it's not going to please the Lord, right? We can put you this way. Integrity is more important than popularity. Your integrity is more important than popularity with them out there. The fourth way that fear of man is a snare, it silences our witness. Silences our witness. I will draw your attention to Peter in the New Testament. Last Supper, Jesus is like, listen, one of y'all is getting, to, getting ready to betray me. Peter's like, bro, it won't be me. Guarantee it, Jesus saying, I would never do that. I don't know about these fools over here, but like, I would never do that, Jesus. You ever been there before? Like, Jesus, I will never, I would, uh, Jesus, if you call me to do it, Lord, I'll do whatever it is. Jesus said to Peter, like, mm, not once, not twice, three times. You're actually going to deny me. The question is, why did Peter deny Jesus? Why did he actually follow through with it? It's called fear of Man. Now, here's the beautiful thing, is that Peter then, after Jesus has been resurrected in John 21, you can go read this when you get home, Jesus restores him. He has an encounter with the risen Christ. And then we read in Acts, oh, his fear changed. He wasn't so scared of people anymore. Now he's scared and has a fear, a healthy fear of the Lord. And they're like, listen, Peter, you need to go in to shut your mouth and quit talking about Jesus. And he was like, yeah, yeah, no. That's not going to happen. See, that Jesus that you killed, he is the Lord. He is the Messiah. He is God, and I will not stop talking about him no matter what you all say. Listen, sometimes it's okay to be silent in certain situations for sure, but other times it's cowardly. Let me ask you this question. Who would hear about Jesus if fear wasn't an issue? How many people out there today would have already heard about Jesus if it wasn't for us walking in a spirit of fear and a fear of man and what they might say about us? How many people around you today have not heard about Jesus because you have a fear of man? The antidote to all of this is that we have to change our thinking. Romans chapter 12, verse 2, right? We've, we've, we've studied this all summer, right? We have to have a renewal of our our mind and our thinking. How do we have that? We submit our bodies as a living sacrifice to the Lord, and we have an experience with the truth, right? It's Jesus. Jesus is the truth, right? And y'all remember, it's the truth that you know that will set you free. It's not the truth that will set you free. It's the truth that you know that will set you free, right? It's the truth that you know that will set you free. Let me give you seven truths that will set you free from a fear of man. Number one, God can't please everybody. He can't, right? <laughs> there are a lot of people that do not like him, amen, right? And he's not too concerned about it, right? 
It's your choice. You have free will. I have free will. So therefore, if everybody's not happy with God and they're not all pleased with God, why should you try to please everybody? Right? <laughs> Luke 6, verse 26. I love this. Woe to you when all men speak well of you. This is Jesus speaking. Woe to you when everybody speaks well of you. So if everybody is speaking well of you, you are speaking nothing. Right? You are only wanting people to like you. You stand for nothing and you'll fall for anything. Yeah. Number two, God didn't create me to live for other people's approval. Boy, that's a good truth. Some of y'all need to say it to you yourself today. God did not create you. He did not create me to get the approval of everybody else. I don't know if y'all know this, but we're in, getting ready to be in a beautiful, oh, just our favorite time of year of election cycle. I know a lot of you are ready for these commercials. You want to see all of them and everybody bickering back and forth at each other. You just, oh, yay, this is my favorite time to watch TV. This is great, right? But I will tell you this. I'm probably pretty accurate here. In this voting time or any other voting time, what's going to end up happening is about half the people are going to vote one way and about half the people are going to vote the other way, right? I mean, that's about, that's about right. About give or take a few, but it's roughly that. And so it's interesting that you, you run for an office and like half the people aren't going to like you, right? Now, some of you today, that would cripple you if you knew half the people you encountered didn't like you, right? If they didn't like you for what you stood for, would you still stand for what you believe in? How many of you may ask you this way? Are you consumed by your approval rating? Like if you could get an actual approval rating of yourself, would that consume your brain and you try to go up higher? Like I'm only at 60%. I got to get at 70. I need to get at 80. I got to make sure all these people like me. <laughs> Here's a word for somebody. Another human cannot meet all your needs. You can't. There is no human on this planet that can meet all your needs. Not your spouse, not your kids, not your job, not your boss. They cannot meet all of your needs. Let me say this to you. If you live and hunger for other people's acceptance, you're going to die by their rejection. The third truth that's going to set you free is this. God's promise of eternity is most important. God's promise of eternity is is the most important thing in my life. 1 John chapter 2, verse 17. And this world is fading away along with everything that people crave. But anyone who does what pleases God will do what? Live forever. Listen, what seems so important now is only temporary in this world. Do not give in to what the world wants to feed you that the most important things are your success and your wealth and your fame. That's all short-term thinking. Right? Let me ask you a question. Can you remember what was most important to you in high school? Is it that important now to you? Right? Is it really? <laughs> Just real quick. Uh, I can remember one of the most important things for me in high school. And some of y'all are going to be like, yes, sir. I'm this. Yep, word to that. Let me tell you something. At the field house right next to it where we would park at high school, there was only like, I don't know, six or eight spots that had a trash can spot. And if you got the trash can spot... No one parked next to you. You could straddle that line and like nobody would park next to you. Come on, somebody. Like that was, that was a big deal. You get that spot. But it's amazing how when you're in a certain season of life, that whatever is your problem, whatever is your situation, it seems more important than anything in your life. And when you move into a new season, it doesn't seem as important as it was. But yet eternity is always the most important thing for us as believers. See, maturity is this. Spiritual maturity is this. When you understand that most things aren't that important and you can let things go and you can move on, knowing that this life is not the end. The fourth truth is this. God is the only one I have to please. Well, that'll free you right there. God is the only one that I have to please. Galatians chapter 1, verse 10, Paul said it this way. Obviously, I'm not trying to win the approval of people, but of God. If pleasing people were my goal, I would not be Christ's servant. <laughs> so therefore, when I understand that I'm only called 
to please God and nobody else. I really got to focus on pleasing him. I don't have to live a life of idolatry. I don't have to bow down to money or some career or what the world says success is or some relationship or worshiping anything of this world. I don't have to live like that. The fifth thing will set you free is this. God will hold me accountable. God will hold you and me accountable. Why do you say that? Romans chapter 14 verse 12 says it very clear. Yes, each of us will give a personal account to God. Every one of us is going to give an account to God. Now hearing that, does that make you scared or confident? Does that make you walk in fear of man? Like, oh no. Or does it make you confident that the Lord has called me to live a certain way and I'm just going to drop all the rest of this fear of man stuff and I'm going to trust him and walk that way? So listen, if you walk in the fear of man, you will compromise. But if you walk with the fear of God, you will speak boldly and you'll defend the word of God. I don't think somebody heard it. Listen. God's going to hold you accountable. And when you walk in the fear of God, you will speak boldly and you will defend the word of God. So when somebody asks you, well, is there really only one way to heaven? You can say yes. Yes. Well, is there really a heaven? Yes. Is there really a hell? Yes. Is marriage supposed to be between a man and a woman? Yes. Is sex outside of marriage a sin? Yes. Are there only two genders? Yes. Are we supposed to protect the sanctity of life? Yes. And here's, I hear this sometimes. Well, I'm just going to leave that up to God. Here's another one. Everybody has to make up their own mind. Those two quotes, and many like them, are quoted directly from the fear of man. I want you to know that. And if you ever get tempted by the fear of man, and you get approached to speak the truth, and you have this temptation to back away to please other people. Let me give you my piece of advice. And this is what happens to me because every now and then I'll get in a situation. I got to speak in front of a bunch of people or speak in front of somebody who obviously does not agree with me, but I go on how to speak regardless. And I'll have that temptation. I want to back away and water it down, but I got to step forward. And here's what always helps me stand firm in what I believe is I remember what Christ did on the cross. What do I mean? He did not deny me. So I will not deny him. I don't care what people say. I do not care. I love people. I want them to know Jesus. But I I will not back down. We cannot back down just because they disagree. Luke chapter 9, verse 26. Jesus said, if anyone is ashamed of me and my message, the Son of Man will be ashamed of that person when he returns in his glory and in the glory of the Father and the holy angels. I don't know about you, but that's enough for me. I just read that. I'm... I don't really care what people think about it. I really don't, right? God's going to hold me accountable. Number six, God designed me to be me. Some of y'all need to speak that over your life today. You're trying to be somebody else. God designed me to be me. Listen, when you, when you see the Lord in heaven one day, I'm going to tell you what, he's not going to say, hey, how popular were you? How was your approval rating with the world? I, I would like to know. How much money did you make? How, much th- how many things did you have? What the Lord's going to ask you one day is, did you fulfill the purpose that I created for you? Romans chapter 12, verse 2, I've already said it once, I'm going to say it again. Do not be conformed to this world. No, no, don't be conformed to it. See, God designed me a certain way, but if I give in to conforming to the world, what, what the enemy is going to try to do is form you and me all to be the same. Some people, sometimes they think about the, the sinful life and that it's freedom. Oh, no, 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 no. The sinful life is prison. What God offers is freedom. It's the truth that sets you free, right? So don't be conformed because if you're conformed, you're going to be restricted, Ah, but if I'm transformed by the renewing of my mind, there's freedom, right? Because now I follow the one who's limitless. (laughs) And the seventh thing that's going to bring you some freedom today, God formed me for worship. God formed me for worship. If you're a believer today, he formed you for worship. Let me explain to you like this. 
Give me a couple of these here. Okay. So here's the thing. Here's what happens, the difference between fear of man and fear of God. See, when you have fear of man, and you call yourself a Christian, you're still called to worship. So, okay, you got fear of man. I got, uh, I got to appease these people. I, want to, I got to please these people over here in this group. Of person. I got to please these people. And then on social media, I make sure I please these people. I got to please these people over here. Okay, uh, but I got to worship the Lord. But I got to please these people first because they're more important to me. So here's what I got to do. I'm just going to start juggling all these people. And they, they, well, hold on. I'll get to you, Lord, in a minute. Hold on. I've got to please these people. I've got to please you. juggle all these things. I'm like, oh, my gosh, I've got to keep on all these people. I've got to make them happy. I've got to make them happy. Make them like me. And then if, I don't, if they don't like me, then my whole world's going to fall apart. And like, ah. And so you live a life, a fear of man, is constantly juggling approval of other people. And you can't worship. See, the fear of God looks like this. I'm not juggling anything. I'm just worshiping. So you can't worship the Lord when you're juggling the approval of other people. You can't do it, right? And it looks silly. So the fear of God is I worship one name. Right? See, the fear of man is worshiping the wrong name. You could put a plural after that. The fear of man is worshiping the wrong names. Ah, but the fear of God is worshiping the name above all names. And his name is Jehovah Jireh. He is our provider. He is Jehovah Nisi. He's our defender. He is Jehovah Sid Kinu. He is righteous. He's the righteous one that makes us righteous. He is Jehovah Rapha. He's our healer. He's Jehovah Shalom. He is our peace. He's Jehovah Shammah, who is present, ever-present help in time of need. He is the great I am. He is the bread of life. He is the light of the world. He is the gate. He is the good shepherd. He is the resurrection. He is the, he is the way. He's the truth. He's the life. He's the true vine. He's our wonderful counselor. He's our mighty God. He's the everlasting father. He is the prince of peace. His name is Jesus. Yeah. Yep. And you and I, we can live a fearless life because of who he is. Amen? Not because of anything that I've done, because of who he is and what his name brings to the table. Amen? Because we have authority through his name. We, as believers, we have authority through the name of Jesus. See, his name is above every name. His name is above poverty. His name is above defeat. His name is above fear. His name is above addiction. His name is above sickness. When his name is spoken, demons tremble. The storms are calmed by the mention of his name. The dead are raised by the mention of his name. Sick are healed. Blind eyes open. Lame are walked. Food multiplied. All by the mention of the name of Jesus. We have authority through his name. And number two, we have salvation through his name. We have salvation through his name. There is no salvation Outside of the blood of Jesus, no man will ever be saved. This world can't save you. Your good works can't save you. Little gold stickers next to your name is not going to save you. None of that is going to save you. We are saved by grace through faith so that none of us can boast. Well, look at what I did. No, look at what he did. It's all about what Jesus did on the cross. It's never been about you. It's not going to be about you. It's all about Jesus. Jesus plus nothing is everything. We have salvation because of Christ. We are saved. We are delivered. We are redeemed. We are restored. We are renewed. We are justified because of Jesus. And because what he did on the cross, because he has redeemed me, because he has restored me, because he has justified me, I can now walk in freedom. Freedom from what? from the bondage that I was in, from the bondage that you were in, from the hell you were walking into because of the salvation of Jesus. Woe to us if we tremble before criticism and yawn before the cross. Woe to us if we're scared of what other people say. 
and we look at the cross as less than their opinions. We have power through his name. We have authority. We have salvation. And we have power through the name of Jesus. Why do you say that? Jesus, the Messiah, Son of God, all-powerful God, decided to come here on this planet. He didn't have to come, but he came fulfilling hundreds of prophecies. He could have came any time he wanted to. He came at the exact right time. Why? So that we could be saved and he could be the perfect sacrifice. And then Jesus said, it is better for me to go than to stay. Like, wait a minute. That's not what you're supposed to do, Jesus. You're the Messiah. You're supposed to say, no, no, no. It is better for me to go. For a couple of reasons. Number one, I'm going to come back again. Say, I came in grace and love this time, but oh, the next time it's going to be in glory. It's going to be a little different next time I come, okay? But between now, between grace and glory, between there, I'm going to leave you a helper. I'm going to leave you an advocate. And his name is the Holy Spirit that will guide you and sanctify you and change you by the power of the name of Jesus. And some of you in here today, you are sleeping and bowing down to fear of man. And you have forgotten that you have the power of the Holy Spirit inside of you. And you are not tapped into that. You need to wake up and stop sleeping. Stop walking in fear and walking with a spirit of fear. And start walking with the power of the Holy Spirit. Because when God calls you to go, when God calls you to pray, when God calls you to serve, whatever it is he's calling you to do, it's not in your power, it's in the power of the Holy Spirit. So we go in confidence. And the last thing, we have peace through his name. We have authority, we have salvation, we have power, we have peace. Philippians chapter 4, verse 6 and 7. Be anxious for nothing but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving. Let your requests be known to God. Here we go. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding. The peace of God which surpasses all opinions of this world. Will guard your heart because the world will not guard your heart. It will pollute your heart. And you'll pollute your mind. He will actually guard your heart and your mind through Christ Jesus. There's some of you here today. You need peace in your life. You know you do. And you are not going to access the peace that you need from this world and from their approval. It won't happen. Don't give in to it. I'm telling you. That's what I'm trying to sell you. Is if you'll just bow down, if you'll shut your mouth and get in line, there'll be peace. Oh, no, there won't. Oh, no, there won't. Any peace that you feel is a false peace, and it's temporary. Right? Let me tell you something. We have authority through the name of Jesus. We have salvation through the name of Jesus. We have power through the name of Jesus. We have peace through the name of Jesus. And the name of Jesus hasn't changed. He's the same today, yesterday, and tomorrow. Hasn't changed. Let me ask you a question. Will you leave here today with the fear of man or with the peace of God? Will you leave here today with your fear of man or with the fear of God? Completely your choice. There are many people today, some of you in here today, you won't come to the altar, fear of man. If some of you here today, you call yourself a Christian, you won't witness to people, people at your work or your family, whatever, fear a man. If some of you are not walking in the life that God has called you to live because you have a fear of man. Listen, fear of man is a fear of rejection. And if you live, if you live with a fear of rejection and a fear of man, you are giving away power over your life to somebody else who does not deserve that power. I'm going to close with this. I'm gonna actually gonna, I think I'm going to read it. Philippians chapter 3. I got a second. I know y'all won't care, right? It doesn't matter if you like it or not. I'm going to read it anyways. Um, <laughs> Philippians chapter 3. Paul is speaking. <laughs> mm. And Paul is telling, I had everything. I had everything before I knew Jesus. 
I had position. I had power. I had approval of other people. The world loved me. I had it all. The world would be like, Luke, Paul, Paul's the man, right? He would be applauded, paraded. Look at Paul. He's great. Ah, but then he met Jesus. Verse 7. I once thought these things were valuable, but now I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done. Yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his, listen, for his sake, I have discarded everything else and counted it all garbage so that I could gain Christ and become one with him. I no longer count on my own righteousness through obeying the law. Rather, I become righteous through faith in Christ. For God's way of making us right with himself depends on faith. I want to know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. I want to suffer with him, sharing in his death, so that one way or another I will experience the resurrection from the dead. No person can take the place of Christ in your life. No person. I ask you this again. Will you leave here today with the fear of man or the peace of God? God sent his son Jesus to come and live a life that you can't live. You can't. You can't. A sinless, perfect life because he is to be and was the perfect sacrifice for you and for me so that our sin and our guilt could be transferred on his body when he went on that cross. He took the pain and the punishment that you and I deserve. He stood in your place. And now you can experience freedom. Because of what he did. You don't have to fear man anymore. We have to stand bold in the face of the enemy. And whatever the enemy's trying to do, we say, no, I will not fear man. I will fear, fear God and him alone. Oh, hey, everybody. Thank you again for watching this video. I do pray and hope that you are going to really heed to what God's trying to speak to you today through his word. God has a plan and purpose for your life. Don't forget that. Let's pray about it. Father, I thank you that you do have a plan and purpose for every person who's watched this video. It wasn't by accident that they watched this video, that you want to actually guide them and direct them in everything that they do, God. I pray for the courage for them that's inside of them to take a step of faith today to follow you. We love you. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you again. For tuning in, click that subscribe button. We got more content coming out.